All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 9, Section 3, On the Move, The Transportation Revolution. So within transportation, it's probably the easiest to visualize the change that the Industrial Revolution um, takes place. You know, our previous definition of the Industrial Revolution was that it changed the way that goods were made, right, going from handmaking to machine making, but also distributed. And again, we'll just sort of reiterate, distributed, distributed. we'll just sort of re reiterate the transformation that's taking place. It's going from a process in which the source of power is a natural run. So if we think about, you know, getting from point A to point B, uh, we have manpower or human power, maybe that's more appropriate, um, which means you could walk from one place or another. There is animal power. Oops, that's not how you spell animal. Uh, animal power, you can ride a horse. Uh, wind power, which would be sailing on a ship or something like that. And water power, that would be using the current of the ocean or using the current of the river to get from one place or another. And since the beginning of human history, people got around um, from point A to point B and distributed goods from point A to point B in one of these four ways, you know, no matter what. This all gets replaced in the Industrial Revolution by the steam engine, right? And now the steam engine is the source of power, first in the form of steam ships or steam boats, but more, um, maybe more, uh, the bigger impact is in the form of trains and railroads. And this is really what, um, what the uh, transportation revolution is about. Again, think about the amount or the quantity of goods that one can get from point A to point B, you know, using animal power as opposed to using a train. Far more goods can be transported on a train than can be on horseback or ox or whatever other animal that is used. So, you know, really the new inventions here, the things that are new in the 1800s are railroads and steamships. And of course, because of these new inventions, this creates a need to transform the landscape so that they can accommodate them. Uh, the United States and you know people in Congress and presidents really look towards these new innovations as a quote-unquote march of progress, the idea that new technology was good. And so initially it was steamships, or I should say even before that, it was the construction of roads to accommodate previous forms of transformation, mainly you know human power and animal power. And so states really beginning, uh, you know, not not too long after the Constitution uh, began to invest more heavily in internal transportation to try and rely really less on Europe economically and foster a domestic economy at home. Uh, states built roads, but there was one national highway that was created, the Cumberland Road, which was a road that connected, uh, we'll say, Maryland to Illinois. And it was one of the few, in fact, it was the only national road project uh, that despite, you know, Americans really wanting to, or at least some, really wanting to create a vast and complicated infrastructure, uh, most of these things happened at a state level. States built their own transportation networks. The Cumberland Road was one uh, example of that. In addition to other road construction, there was private roads that were created. This was turnpikes. The turnpikes is a private road. Uh, we'll say that charges a toll, right? So these were essentially for profit. Um, but you know, if um, you know, if it was worth the investment to travel, or sorry, to tra uh, transport goods from one place to another, then uh, it might make sense for a private company to build a road, charge a small price, and uh, make money off it. Uh, places like New York, for example, built a lot of turnpikes. But with the invention of the steamship came a very strong demand for canals. And a canal is a man-made uh, river, right? a man-made river. The most successful and famous was the Erie Canal, located in New York. It was really an engineering marvel at the time. It was over 300 miles long, one 
The uh, next longest canal at the time was nowhere even close. And it was a huge success because it connected the Atlantic Ocean with the Great Lakes region. You know, so it allowed for commerce, oops, it allowed for commerce to make it from the Atlantic uh, into the Great Lakes, into places like Chicago, into the interior of the United States, into some of that Northwest territory that was being so aggressively settled at that time. And uh, all of these internal improvements fall under this umbrella, uh, umbrella term we call the American system. The American system is a good term to know just in general. It's related to a lot of these internal improvements in transportation, road construction, canal construction, railroad construction, but it's also tied to uh, other things, right? So we're just going to say that the American system is a quote unquote catch all uh, term to describe. internal or maybe domestic improvements, right? So transportation is a big part of it, but it's not the only part of it. It could also include things like tariffs. Recall that tariffs are taxes on foreign goods. It's designed to foster domestic, um, domestic companies. Uh, and we could also put the second national bank here, or the second bank of the United States under this. Again, any sort of internal improvement in the early 1800s, whether it's canals or railroads or protective tariffs or banking or whatever it is, it falls under this term called the American system. Again, that's a term that you probably do want to be familiar with, the American system. So for all the road construction and all the canal construction, uh, you can see here, couple of images provided by the text. You know, this is a canal with a steamship that's on it. Uh, here in Indiana, there's a, a, you know elaborate canal network that was constructed. Uh, a little bit lower here, you get New York's. This is Lake Ontario. The Erie Canal would have, Erie Canal would have been about right here. Um, what you can't see is that uh, in New York, there's a river that goes north and south called the Hudson. I believe this is probably the Hudson River. And uh, the Erie Canal then connected the Hudson River, which this goes out to the Atlantic. Roll down here a little bit. Uh, that goes out to the Atlantic Ocean through New York City, which becomes a, a pretty important uh, city in terms of commerce. So what the um, you know what the Erie Canal allowed for was uh, you know maybe we'll the color that we can see a little bit better is that you know ships could come in from the Atlantic, from Europe, from England, from wherever, uh, from the American South sail up the Hudson River, sail across the Erie Canal, and really get into this Great Lakes region, into the interior of the United States. And so that's why it was so important. Uh, however, though, for all the road construction and canal construction, one thing that really, um, that really triumphed over all of them was railroads. And railroads were more, you know, uh, more efficient uh, than canals and roads. And in some cases, really kind of put canals out of business. The canal age in the United States is, you know, it's a very sort of exciting and, and rapid, rapidly changing the landscape. But canals, you know, you know, it, they're just too expensive to create compared to a railroad, you know, rather than having to dig a man made river, a railroad is just, you know, two iron bars on the ground. And, and once you lay the tracks, then you're good to go. And a train could carry far more than a ship, at least in those days. Um, and so railroads ultimately became kind of the go-to way of transporting goods, of transporting people. And uh, the nations that developed some of the most sophisticated and powerful railroad networks became the, you know, the strongest, uh, militarily, economically, et cetera, et cetera. The uh, Mohawk and Hudson Railroad Company established the first rail service. This happened approximately 1831. By 1860, the U.S. has the most, oops, the most railroads, we'll say railroad track in the world, right? So it's not just that the United States 
uh, had, um, you know, created a lot of improvements in transportation relative to itself. It certainly did. But even when compared to the rest of the world, uh, I believe even that the United States had more railroad mileage than the rest of the world put together, just to kind of put it to perspective. And uh, again, when it came to transporting goods, um, there really is no other uh, way of, of doing it that matches the railroad in this era. And so all these improvements led to Americans, you know, being on the move. Travel times were dramatically decreased. So for example, to go from, I think uh, your textbook says Boston to uh, Rhode Island, I think that's the uh, transportation. It used to take four days before the train, you know, four days by horseback. Uh, now it took half a day thanks to the trade, and, uh, sorry, the train. And like I mentioned before, this not only led to more commerce, uh, this was one of the reasons why we mentioned in the previous chapter, 9.1, that goods became more readily available. Part of that was not just increasing the efficiency at which goods are made, but also meant increase the efficiency to which goods can be distributed. So now goods could go over long distances. Um, you know, before the America, or sorry, before the Industrial Revolution, every single thing that was made or every single thing that a person possessed or had around them would have been made within about a 10 mile radius. Thanks to the industrialization, transport by trains, things can now go over very much long distances. Uh, and it also connected um, people together, right? So isolated, might say isolated farm families. It's getting all sorts of spelling wrong. Uh, now became tied in with an American culture. And you certainly see that more so in the areas that have a lot more rail networks. We're talking specifically here in the north. This is going to be important later. But a lot of these transformations that we're talking about right now, whether it's telegraph, canals, railroads, factories, all of these things are being most intensely felt in the North. And, um, you know, the South is going through its own transformations, but a very different one that Northerners are going through.